So tonight, Matthew chapter 11. You could turn there in your Bibles. Matthew chapter 11. We'll be looking at verses 7 through verse 30. So Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 30. Let's pray and uh, we'll look at the word together. <clears throat> Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have the gospels that tell us about your life. That tell us about what you did while you walked the face of this earth. That tells us you're approachable and real. That you went through everything we go through. That you experienced it all and yet remained sinless. And like we're told in the book of Hebrews, oh Lord, that because you experienced that, because you went through it, we have a, a compassionate, a sympathetic high priest who can identify with us in our weaknesses, in the mistakes we make. And you're sympathetic towards us in that. And praying for us and interceding on our behalf. Oh Lord, we can't thank you enough. That because of you, we can have life. That through the sacrifice that you made, the sacrifice that you paid, that we are seen as sinless when we receive you. What an amazing thing that God has done for us. No, Lord, as we look at this section of Scripture, as we talk about what it is you would have us ponder, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would draw near to you. And, oh, Lord, that our hearts would desire to ever draw near to you. We love you, Lord Jesus. Speak to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week, we looked at the first few verses of this chapter, and we read how John the Baptist had sent two of his disciples to Jesus to inquire as to whether or not Jesus was the one. And it says this, in chapter 11, verse 1, it says, no, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I was working on sheetrock all day and dust, even though wearing my mask, it still tickles. Anyway, chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. John had been arrested by Herod and bound in prison. Upon hearing what happened to John, we're told that Jesus actually left that region and he went to Galilee. And again, John had been in prison for about 10 months when, and had received reports from his disciples about Jesus and about what was going on with Jesus and what he was doing. And seemingly, John starts to doubt as he is bound and probably feeling alone and forgotten. The precursor, the forerunner, the best man of the bridegroom was left there in prison. And so John's disciples come to Jesus and ask the question on John's behalf. And Jesus responds with actions that bear the proofs of messianic prophecy out of Isaiah chapter 35 and Isaiah 61, pointing him to the passage that spoke of his deeds. But leaving off the ending of Isaiah 61 that would have spoke about John's current situation. Jesus talked of the blind seeing, of the lame walking, the lepers cleansed, the deaf hearing, the dead raised, and the poor having the gospel preached to them. But he stopped where it spoke of the brokenhearted, the captives, and the prisoners. And instead, Jesus spoke a new beatitude to John. He said, blessed, oh how happy. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Pointing out to John that the ones who were spiritually bound were being ministered to. And he who is spiritually free in reality was fine. John stays in prison. He never comes out again. He finishes his race there. Gets, ends up being beheaded. But it's not recorded that he ever doubted again. And it was satisfied with the answer that his Lord gave him. And he quietly fulfills his ministry there in prison. Now, once the disciples of John leave, Jesus spoke again. 
And look at what he says in chapter 11, verse 7. As they departed, as the disciples of John departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you. And more than a prophet. Verse 10. For this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. But if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The message had been sent back to John. And now Jesus speaks of him in glowing terms that no doubt would have been of comfort to John. But the reality is Jesus absolutely sent the words to John that John needed to hear. And to the multitude, Jesus spoke the words that they needed to hear about John. Jesus asked the multitude three times, what did you go in the wilderness to see? The wilderness, a place multitudes would not typically go out to without cause. And John drew multitudes out there. And Jesus asked them, did you go for the scenery? Did you go for the show? Or did you go for the message? First he asked that they went to see a reed shaken by the wind. Did you just go to see who this is? What he was doing out there? To see the spectacle of a man thinking he's soft and pliable like a reed in the wind. No, that's not John. He was steady and strong, not shaken easily by the political or spiritual enemies. When you look at the words that he spoke, you can see that clearly. And Jesus asks if they went to see a man clothed in soft garments. Did you go to just see one crying out like an actor, like those in costume playing a character, or like the garments worn in court? That wasn't John. He didn't go for the normal comforts others sought conspicuously so when you look at what he wore and what he ate. And ironically, Jesus points out that one clothed like this is in the king's house. Technically, that's where John was. But I think he meant the house, not the king's prison. If not those things, then do you must have gone out to hear the message. Did you go to see a prophet? Now remember, there had been no prophets or prophetic message for 400 years prior to John's arrival. And here he is, so much more than a prophet. Jesus points to John as the chosen herald of Messiah. Not a man pleaser like a reed blowing in the wind or a self pleaser like one and wearing soft garments. But a prophet above all the other prophets because he got to be the forebear, the precursor of Jesus Christ himself announcing his arrival. Because John alone had that privilege to hold the ministry as the prophet that got to point others to Jesus physically. Think about that. All the other prophets got to point others to Jesus prophetically. John got to point others to Jesus physically. Not just point to him as one to come prophetically. No, his eyes got to see the fulfillment of all the Old Testament messianic prophecies. And like we went over last week, yet still, even John, even John doubted and had to send his disciples to ask, are you the one? Are you the one or do we look for another? He was the last of the Old Testament prophets, the last one to come before Jesus and the last one ever needed to pave the way for the coming of Messiah, for Messiah to show up. And Jesus points to John as the fulfillment of prophecy regarding the coming Messiah. Like it says, he cited Isaiah 40, verse 3, where it says, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. That was what John's message was. And Malachi 3, 1, where it says, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And Jesus calls him the greatest of any born of women. And out of all of that, Jesus still says that he who is the least 
in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Can you imagine yourself in that way? Can you imagine yourself? How could I be greater than John the Baptist? When you look at John's ministry, who he was, his faithfulness in life. You see, even though John was great, the greatest of the prophets, greatest of those born of women, he was not born again under the new covenant. He lived, he prophesied, he ministered, and he died before the completion of Jesus' work on the cross and before his resurrection. We'll see him in heaven. But there's a difference between Christians, people who have accepted Christ under the new covenant, and believers under the old covenant. He lived, he prophesied, he ministered, and he died before the completion of Jesus' work at the cross and before his resurrection, before the completion of the ministry of redemption. And so he did not enjoy the benefits that come with the new covenant, even though his ministry was to point all to the one bringing the new covenant. When you think of it, the least in the gospel stand on higher ground than the greatest under the law. Because that's where John the Baptist was residing, still under the law. That's the thing to consider. Much like Moses, the bringer of the law, which points to death, could not cross the Jordan River into the promised land. But Joshua brought them from judgment into life. And so it is with John. The last of the prophets of the new covenant could not also be the first of the new covenant. The old covenant, which points to death, was done away with. The new covenant, which points us to life, came with Jesus. All of the prophets and the law pointed to and anticipated that moment. Prior to this, every other prophet announced Messiah is coming. And John alone had the privilege of saying that Messiah was here. And so in that light, it makes sense through that lens of the whole picture why John would remain in prison. The law must be completed. Jesus did that. The law fulfilled its purpose. It pointed out our own insufficiency to fulfill all of God's requirements. All of God's requirements for holiness. And so the law must die for the new covenant to come into play. And so with John, he completed his mission. He fulfilled his ministry. And now the last of the old died. And in the light, it's easier to see why John would now be at peace in prison. Because I think God started to reveal to him through Jesus' words that his mission was completed, that he was okay, that he was okay. And now Jesus goes from his comments about John to rebuking those who complained about both John the Baptist and Jesus. In chapter 11, verse 16, it says, but to what shall I like in this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We mourned to you and you did not lament. And so John came neither eating nor drinking and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking. They say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. So Jesus turns again to the multitudes and includes them all in how the message and the messengers have been received and compares them to a group of children who aren't happy either dancing or mourning, comparing that to the criticism being hashed around about both John and himself, the idea being that those who have a heart to criticize will always find something to criticize. That the austere approach of John did not please them, nor did the inclusive approach of Jesus. John neither ate nor drank anything, but the simple and strict diet he had, locusts and honey. He had a demon. Jesus ate and drank, and he was called names, glutton and wine-bibber, which means a habitual drinker of wine. They weren't happy with either John or Jesus. There was no pleasing them. And then Jesus quoted the complaints against them. That he dared to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. In that generation, in that culture, some of the harshest words of condemnation are some of the sweetest to think about now when you think about it. What a wonderful thing to know. That Jesus is the friend of the lowest of the low. That Jesus is the friend of the ones who are outcast. The tax collectors and sinners who are looked at at the bottom rung of society. And they're saying that Jesus is a friend of them. And Jesus doesn't disagree with that. Because he is. And that thought brings me so much peace. 
that it doesn't matter who we are, where we come from, what our background is, what our stratus of social <laughs> climbing is, or where we uh, fall in that thought or in that vein. None of that matters before God. Because before Jesus Christ, we're all the same. It doesn't matter. Before Him, we are all the same. And Jesus showed in His ministry that He was the friend of all of the outcast. And I'm so blessed by that. I am so blessed by that. Wisdom is justified by your children. The wise man is proved wise by his wise actions. Jesus had especially in mind the wisdom to accept both John and Jesus for what they were and what they were called to be. People criticized. But look at what John and Jesus did. John led thousands into repentance and prepared the way for the Messiah. Jesus taught and worked and loved and died like no one ever has and like no one else ever could. Criticism didn't stop them from the call and the purpose that God had placed on or ordained for both of them to fulfill. In chapter 11, verse 20, it says, Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin, which is the city in Galilee. War to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Now the principle of this rebuke is that since most of the great works of Jesus were done in these cities, they experienced and were exposed to a greater light, which also requires a greater accountability. And when you think about this rebuke in that manner, then how great the accountability must be for our nation, our people before God. No other country has ever had greater access and exposure to the gospel than our country. And yet the rejection of God that permeates our society points to a depravity of heart that needs desperate repentance. We, as a people, are without excuse. And it's easy to look down on the people that rejected Jesus when he walked the earth, but he still does walk the earth today. Living inside of us through the Holy Spirit, we are just as equally, if not more than equally, accountable before God as the cities that Jesus walked through physically. And you look at the cities mentioned, and as one commentator stated, these cities did not attack Jesus Christ. They didn't drive him from their gates. They didn't seek to crucify him. They simply disregarded him. Neglect can kill as much as persecution can. They disregarded Jesus, and Jesus holds them to account for that. And he also mentioned that the judgment will be more tolerable for those exposed to a lesser light. And according to passages like Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 through 42, or Matthew 23, 13 and 14, or Luke 12, 47 and 48, evidently there are different degrees of that judgment and reward, all of which makes the implication for our society all the more sobering. When you think about it that way, we've been exposed to a great light. We have churches everywhere. And we've heard the gospel repeatedly. Are we responding to it in the way that God expects us to respond to it? Are we responding to it in what he says it is to be a Christian, to love the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? To, to love others more than we love ourselves as much as we love ourselves, like we love ourselves, however you want to phrase it, in whatever translation you have, it means the same thing. Our responsibility is to love God and love other people. That's what he's called us to do. He gave us two basic commandments that we have so much trouble keeping. Love him and love other people. He made it very simple for salvation. He said, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart he's risen from the dead and you're saved. That's all it takes. And yet we don't want to turn to that in humility before a living God like we should. We're without excuse. 
We have all that at our fingertips. And we disregard Jesus Christ just like those cities did. Verse 25 says, At that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Now Jesus shifts from his rebuke of unbelief to praise the Father for those who do believe. With the perpetual communion of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, even though nothing audible was recorded, it should be no surprise that the heart of Jesus was answering what the Father was saying to him. Jesus was happy that God had chosen the unlikely, that it wasn't the wise or the prudent that were responding to the message of Christ. It was the simple, the babes who were responding. Those who with faith like a child. And even then, it's because the Father has revealed to them and to us so we can take no pride in the fact that we've come to believe. It's simply through Him. The other thing in this section is the amazing self-claim that Jesus makes. Look at verse 27 again. All things have been delivered to me by the Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Jesus referred to himself as the Son and proclaimed that only he had a true relationship with God the Father, and that the Father could only be made known through the Son. Jesus is again making it clear. He's God incarnate. And there's an important difference in the way that the Son knows the Father and the way we may know Him. We know God the Father because He stoops low to us to make Himself known. God the Son knows the Father because they are equal in nature, completely compatible with one another. And so Jesus goes from answering John's doubts to praising John publicly to rebuking those who criticize John and himself, to warning them of the implications of their unbelief, to praising what the Father has done in those who believe as simply as a child, to this invitation. In verse 28, it says this, Come to me, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Jesus had just rebuked some and praised some, and now he extends the invitation to all. Come to me. Come to me. Who else could say that but God? Come to me. In his love, he does not stop reaching out, even to those who do not believe. You know, nothing good happens. In fact, it gets bad when people say, come to me or follow me, like they have something of value to offer that is better than what Jesus has. Only Jesus can say, come to me, and actually give life and peace and joy. No other name under heaven or on earth or under the earth will ever do anything for anyone other than the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus directed the call to those who were burdened in two ways. Labor implies the burden we take upon ourselves. Heavy laden implies the burdens others put on us. And Jesus suggested the same thought in Matthew 23, 4, where he spoke against the religious leaders of his day as those who bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders while they themselves would not even lift a finger to move something. And Jesus promises that when we come to him, he will relieve us of all those burdens we take um, on ourselves or that others put on us. And then Jesus invites us to take his yoke upon us, to shed all other burdens and be joined to him, yoked to him, and learn from him. <coughs> Excuse me. To be a disciple, a learner, to be willing to be guided by him, not to merely receive something, but to be a doer. And now when you think about a yoke, you guys know what a yoke is, right? In reality, it's something that's designed with the intent of making a burden easier to carry for people or animals. Yokes were custom made and designed specifically for the wearer. 
A poorly designed or, or crafted yoke could hurt the animal or hurt the person or imbalance the load. And then the, the job could not be done well or efficiently. And if it was a double yoke, you were yoked with someone or something else, then it was all the more critical, as typically they would match a more experienced ox with a younger one in need of training. And the yoke had to fit both properly so that the stronger one could lead the team. And the younger would follow alongside, and it would even even the load so that both were bearing it. But the stronger, more experienced would be bearing the greater load and leading by example, teaching the other how to do the task. A poorly matched team or a poorly designed or crafted yoke wouldn't do. And in that light, we're told that the ancient Jews commonly used the idea of a yoke to express someone's obligation to God. There was the yoke of the kingdom. There was the yoke of the law, the yoke of the command, the yoke of repentance, the yoke of faith. And the general yoke of God in this context, it's easy to see Jesus using this example and simply combining it all and saying, forget about all those other yokes. Forget about all the other things you can be joined to and take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I will carry the majority of the burden. And now with that understanding, let's look at the last three statements that Jesus made here. He said, I'm gentle and lowly of heart. Jesus reveals part of his nature here, as it's a, his servant's heart displayed throughout all of his ministry, making him qualified to be the one to bear our burdens. He will not lend it us and lead us in such a way that we are just dragging along after him like tin cans tied to the bumper of a car, but like an ox yoked to a, a younger ox. He will go as fast or slow as we need him to go so that we can learn and do what he is exampling for us to do. We don't have to strive to forge ahead of him, as that will just lead to us to chaff against the yoke and harm ourselves, as he will not ever, we will not ever be able to overpower the stronger ox, per se. We will never be able to overpower Jesus and make him go faster. And we must relax into the timing of the Lord and let him lead. As the, the master gently and lowly, the gentle and lowly would never carve a, cause us harm. The other thing he said is you will find rest for your souls. And Jesus describes his gift to his followers. Rest for our souls. He echoes the passage out of Jeremiah chapter 6 where it is the offer of God to those who follow his example, his way. And Jesus issues the same invitation in his own name. Rest for our souls. It's kind of funny. I get to the last page of my notes and my toner is going out. Look at that. There's half a page there. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. Well, we're done. <laughs> but regardless of what that says, let's, it reminds us, the people, the only way to find rest for our souls is to walk in the ways of God. And Jesus adds that the way of God, the way of God is with him, yoked to Jesus Christ, learning and following his example. It's nothing complicated, just following him. And out of that, the promise is that we have rest for our souls. And the last thing he says is, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And Jesus summarizes his invitation with that promise and that assurance. The yoke is easy and the burden is light because he bears it with us. Born evenly, just like the response of the people out of Jeremiah chapter 6, it might be unbearable, but with Jesus bearing a yoke and bearing the burden is easy and light. Remember what we talked about regarding yokes. When training a younger animal, how would they do it? They would pair it with a, an, an ox that was stronger, but was, had more experience, and enough experience to know how to plow. 
And when the farmers back then, they would often yoke it to an older and stronger, more experienced animal who bore the brunt of the responsibility, who bore the brunt of the weight and could train the young animal through the learning process. And the word easy means this, for this, when he's talking about the yoke, the word easy means that it's well-fitting, that it's fit for use, that it's useful, virtuous, manageable, mild, and pleasant. When he says his, his yoke is easy and his burden is light, that's what he's talking about. These yokes were made of wood. The yoke was carefully crafted so that it would fit well and not gall the neck of the animal. The yoke was tailor-made to fit each and every one of them. And our God knows enough how to make a yoke for us too. If that's the care that they took with a yoke for an animal. And his promise is that if he's making a yoke for you, it would be easy and light. That means he's custom made the way for you to walk with him. For him to lead us. For him to carry the burden. To show us and train us how what everything it means to follow him, to walk after him. To give us rest inside of what he's called us to do. And that's his promise. That when we're walking with him, his burden is easy and light. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Whatever it is that the, of the burden that the Lord will place upon you will be custom fit for you and he to bear together. That's the way he did it because he is a good shepherd because he is a good shepherd. Because he walks in humility. It's amazing to me. The God of all the universe would humble himself to become a man. That he would walk the face of the earth and go through all that we endured. That he would endure every temptation that we would ever face that whole time he was out in the wilderness being tempted. And yet withstood it all faithfully. So that at the end of it he could still say, come to me. Just come to me. And his promise is still the same. My burden is easy. My burden is light. I'll carry it with you. You don't have to do this all by yourself. So many times we will think we've got to power through it. We've just got to figure out a way. When God's promise is, no, just stay attached to me. Don't you know it'll be so much easier to bear if you just stay attached to me? That's part of what I think it means when he calls us to abide in him. To abide in him. To stay with him, to not leave him, to allow him to be the one that we are attached to so we could actually make it through all the things that we go through in each and every day. Those examples that he's given us throughout the Gospels about who he is and about his faithfulness, we really need to hold on to. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that those words are true. That as we follow you, oh Lord, as we stay attached to you, oh how faithful you are. Lord, may we know what it means. May we know what it means to abide in you. May you work in us. May you work through us. No, oh Lord, we need your Holy Spirit so desperately. I thank you, Lord Jesus. I thank you for your faithfulness. No, oh Lord, may we learn. May we learn what it means to share the yoke with you. To not try and carry everything all by ourselves. But allow you to be the one who bears the burden. Who bears the brunt. Oh Lord, you carried it all to Calvary. You hung on that cross until you could cry out that it was finished. And you did that with the purpose of having a relationship with us. We are told that you looked at the cross, that you counted it all joy, that you despised the shame, 
but you counted it all joy to endure the cross. You counted it all joy to go through that, which is wildly crazy to think about. I understand the despising the shame part, but I, when I look at what you got out of the deal, that it's us, why would you count it all joy? And yet you do. You count us as your joy. You treasured us enough to complete the mission on the cross so that we could have relationship with you. What an amazing thing. What an amazing thing to think about. Oh, how good you are. We love you, Lord Jesus. And I truly, truly am grateful for what you did so that I could have a relationship with you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Oh, how we need you. Be here with us tonight. And as we go home, I pray that our thoughts, our minds, our hearts would be towards you that we would stay in communion and fellowship with you, our Lord and our Savior. Oh, how good you are. We praise your name. And we ask that you would work in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen.